Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to Engelbard Gaming. I've got a brand new series that I'm starting right now, and I'm calling it How About That. In this series, I'll show you a complete game that's especially impressive in some way for the hardware on which it runs. I'll also give you my commentary on why it's impressive throughout. Think of this series as sort of the opposite of complete trash. For this inaugural episode, I figured, hey, why not stick with our type since we looked at it just recently? This time, though, I'll be playing through the Commodore 64 version of R-Type. I'll keep the preamble short. The arcade version of R-Type, which you're looking at now, had two independent background layers, could show loads of sprites on screen, and had a palette consisting of hundreds of colors. It also had an 8-channel YM2151 FM sound chip. The humble C64, which we're about to look at, had a lot less to work with when it came to technology. We had a single background layer, only 16 colors, a three-channel SID chip for sound, and just a handful of hardware sprites. How could you possibly do a game like R-Type on such terrible-sounding specs, on such drastically reduced hardware compared to the arcade version? Well, this game came along pretty late in the life of the C64, so developers have learned to apply a lot of tricks, which I'll talk about a little bit during the gameplay here. In the end, they produced something that was really impressive despite being just slightly rough around the edges. I want a word on recording methodology. I did use save states while making this video, because I haven't played this game in years and didn't want to have to spend time completely mastering it. I only died about five or six times, so that's cut out. It's not about my gameplay, it's about seeing the game so I could tell you about it. And I also cut out some loading times. There are loading times both at the start and between levels. It could be a little smidge on the long side, uh, so I wanted you to not have to sit through that. So just picture, you know, waiting maybe 30 seconds or so, I don't remember, between levels. And the last thing I'll mention is, as you can probably tell, I've got a bit of a cold now, and you're going to hear me strain a little bit with my voice. I apologize. wanted to get this video out. I didn't want to wait any longer. And I'll tell you what I'm working on next during the commentary on this one. All right, that's enough of this. Let's get on with it. And here we are with the title screen, and Amiga fans may recognize that. Looks pretty nice on the old C64, considering all of its limitations. We have our main title screen. And now we're getting into the game. And I want to stress I did cut out load times and stuff, because there are load times in this. Here is where you get to watch me forget that you have to actually press the button to start the game, and there I finally remember. Good for me. And as you can see right away, this is pretty impressive from the get-go. We have sort of a parallax starfield layer, which looks a lot better than the one we even saw in, say, the PC Engine CD port, or Hue card version. I mean, for running on a little 8-bit system with a lot of graphical limitations, this thing can only show a handful of sprites and we only have a total of 16 colors to work with? This looks pretty amazing, doesn't it? Now look at that, we've got the big robot there, he's about the right size, and sorry about the squeaky voice. <laughs> Remember, I do have a cold here and I'm struggling just to talk today, but I wanted to make sure I got this video out. But still, I mean, this is super impressive. In a lot of ways, I think this one is more impressive than the Sega Master System version, even though the gameplay in that one is a lot more accurate than the gameplay in this one. And one of the things I mean by that is you may have noticed any enemy projectiles that are fired at you, just like regular bullets and stuff, you can destroy them in this. And this section right here with these little circular enemies, they spin around in pretty much every other version. In this one, they just sit still while you destroy them. And when you, you know, destroy the main parts of them in the other versions, the segments stay there, they just become, you know, passive where they're not dangerous. But here we've got our bit, we've just picked up our ring laser, getting missiles, says pretty much everything that's in the arcade version. We certainly recognize this part, which is one of the most iconic views in our type. And we've got that big thing, and we've got all the little turrets at the top of the screen. You will notice that enemies don't fire as much, and a lot of our projectiles are smaller. And, if you didn't catch it, when you fire the ring laser, you don't fire regular bullets in this version when the force is on the front. You only fire the ring laser. So that's a pretty significant difference. And here we are, approaching our first boss. And, once more, considering the limitations of the system, here we see, you know, a bunch of flickering. It still looks pretty great overall. This definitely is not as impressive as, say, the Sega Master System port for this part, 
Uh, but it still looks good. One thing we always have to keep in mind with the C64 when comparing it to other versions, it's multicolor mode, the resolution is incredibly low. I mean, we're talking more similar to what you would find on, say, like a Game Boy Advance than, you know, a, a PC Engine. Look at level 2 here! This version actually has its own little simulated parallax by using animated background tiles. This is something that I said they should have put in the PC Engine and PC Engine CD versions, but didn't. And it looks great! This is one of the only versions, you know, at home, that actually had parallax or simulated parallax in this level. And we've got the large lobster-style sprite things. We don't have as many of them on screen as we do in, you know, the higher-end ports. But they're there. They move a little strangely, but everything's good. These little flower things that shoot out those enemies, they don't come all the way out, so you can't destroy them in this one. But other than that, everything... That was so... it's just so well done here. I mean, I'm so impressed by this version of the game. And then we have the soundtrack. You know, Arcade R-Type didn't have the best soundtrack in the world. A lot of the music was just kind of ho-hum. There were a few good tracks. And most of it used, like, abrasive, super abrasive FM instruments. And I think the interpretation of the soundtrack on the C64 is really good. And I vastly prefer it to the awful music that they added to the CD version of R-Type Complete on the PC Engine CD. So running on the C64 SID chip, it sounds fantastic, it's more upbeat, and it's just different. And as you can see with the snake enemy here, we'll see him again in a second, in the other versions, it wiggles its way around and you destroy, you know, a section of these segments, rendering them uh, passive where they won't fire bullets anymore. In this version, you destroy the entire segment and it just vanishes. Super weird. We're gonna see a bunch of that again as we fight this boss, who is noticeably smaller in this version than he is in the arcade or PC Engine CD versions, or a Hue card version for that matter. Now you can't really, or at least I should say I couldn't really, just park the ship on top of the sensor thing, the eye, like I did in the other versions. Like you could do it, it'll damage it, but you know, you're more likely to get killed in this version, either from a stray bullet on a super weird angle, or like right here, when the stake goes down, it would actually hit where you're sitting on that part. So, you've got to play this a little bit differently uh, than pretty much every other version of R-Type here. Now, I don't fault that. Some things were bound to be different and limited. I just wish that this fight didn't take so long in this version, just because damaging this thing takes forever. I mean, look, we've gone and actually run and repeated the entire cycle. But there we are. We've taken him out, that's the end of level 2. Which means we're going to be moving on to level 3, the giant battleship level. A completely iconic R-type level. How does the C64 handle this one? Uh, not quite as well. For this level, it's all here, but I would say it is the least successful level in the entire game. And I kind of understand why. You know, we have all these limits where just, you know, we can't have the same amount of sprites and stuff going on that we do in the other versions. So because of that, a lot of the battleship that was destructible in other versions is not in this one. It's just solid. We don't have as many guns and turrets and things like that. Uh, here you can see me pick up the green sort of snaky weapon that traces along the uh, ceilings and, and the ground. This is going to be the only time you see me use it in this version of the game. And this part is going to be, you know, one that's quite a bit different. We've still got this big section of the ship that's going to come off. And it will fire a couple of lasers at us. Those lasers are a lot smaller. And you see the thrusters on this section, even though some of them are disappearing due to little glitches here and there, are not actually destructible. Nope, all you've got to do in this one is make your way around them before the ship moves back down to the bottom of the screen. So yeah, the way the ship moves as you progress through the level, similar to the arcade original, but sections of it are just a little bit different. And as we come up to the back end of it here, in the arcade version we have all these turrets that shoot these larger fireballs at you, uh, that you're 
you know, force can't block and your bits can't block. In this version on the C64, we still have the guns, the turrets here, but they just shoot regular bullets that you can either shoot and destroy or uh, absorb, you know, with the force or the bits. And there is me barely squeaking by because I forgot uh, that it went all the way down over there, but I remembered in time. Good for me. And while I am playing a version of R-Type C64 that is cracked here with a trainer on it, I didn't use any of the cheats. I am playing this the legitimate way. I did take a few deaths here. Like I mentioned in the intro, I did use save states. Because the whole point of this is for me to show you the whole game in as efficient a way as possible. It's not to show you that I'm super fantastic at it. And I did die through this run a total of maybe five or six times. And there you can see the end of level three. So we've got the game's worst translated stage behind us, and now we can move on to the game's best translated stage. I mean, wow, look at this. Even in the PC Engine and PC Engine CD ports, we didn't have a star field here. We had a black screen. On the C64, we've got a multi-layer star field. And aside from that, look at all the stuff going on. I mean, it's hard to believe that this is a little tiny 8-bit computer from 1983. I mean, in a lot of ways, this level works better on this system than it does, you know, even in the Sega Master System version, and it's really close to what we got out of the PC Engine, aside, you know, from the resolution, basically. And here we've got a pretty decent take on the soundtrack. I mean, just look at all this stuff going on the screen with the snakes leaving their trails behind that you could shoot. All of it is just super impressive. I, mean, I can't stress enough how great I thought this was. And this did come along very late in the Commodore 64's life. So by the time this game came out, you know, a lot of top-tier developers had learned a lot of tricks to make the system do a little bit more uh, than, you know, would have been thought possible when it was released. If you look at some early C64 games from around the time it came out, I mean, it is night and day compared to this version of R-Type. The crazy thing here is this computer technically only has a sprite limit of eight sprites. And multiplexing is the technique that they used basically to, to trick it into showing a little bit more than should have been possible. And now here's the, the boss that's coming up here. In a lot of ways, is, is again just the most impressive version for an all 8-bit machine. On the Sega Master System, if you've seen this boss, it's nowhere near this smooth. Now this one, they changed it a little bit gameplay-wise. In the arcade version, let's say, you know, you can only shoot the sensors that are exposed in order to destroy a segment. In this version, uh, you can hit it anywhere, but you can't damage it when pieces are at the edge of the screen for some reason. So I've got to wait for them to move uh, until I can damage them again, and there we are. Another gameplay change is any of the lasers that things fire out can be absorbed by your force in this one. Uh, so that makes this game easier in some ways. But, yeah, very impressive. It's great seeing all those big chunks of that ship moving around, right? So here we are on to level 5. A level that would have been super easy to do some sort of simulated parallax scrolling on. But, yeah, we get nothing. As you notice, when you shoot the snakes in this one, the snake heads, the other segments of the snake don't explode in every direction and just fly off the screen like they do in the arcade one. Nope, the head just disappears and you can shoot, you know, each individual segment. In the arcade version, if you shoot the head, it just... everything else scatters. If you shoot it somewhere other than the head, the snake breaks off into a smaller piece and starts going around a lot faster. So that is something that is a kind of a major gameplay change in this one. Here's our laser guys. If you notice, there's kind of a glitch where sometimes they look like the little power-up droid on one of their animation frames. I honestly don't remember if the original did that. It's been a long time since I played this on real hardware. Uh, remember, I am playing this, of course, emulated to be able to use save states and make life easier for recording purposes for this video. But again, we get a, a pretty decent soundtrack here also. Enemy behavior, slightly different than we'd see in most of the other versions especially on, you know, Japanese consoles and computers. 
These sweeper enemies still look pretty good. We're going to see a glitch on some of them coming up. There was a little glitch on one of the robots there. Every now and then you'll also see little artifacts that are sort of left in the background. But still, looks great overall. Here comes our boss fight in just a moment. It's going to be quite a bit different uh, than most other versions of the game. Remember, it's a big collection of rocks that are on top of a satellite thing. In most other versions, you have to destroy a bunch of the rocks to reveal the satellite that you can then shoot to end the level. This boss is just a giant conglomeration of all these rocks. There's nothing underneath. You just keep blasting away until you destroy the whole thing. So this boss is very different. Still impressive, though, in how large it is and how easily it moves around the screen on the C64. Again, 1983 8-bit system. And here's another level that they just did a super great job on in every way. Now, the arcade version had these big truck-like things that, you know, went around the level and got in your way and stuff. In this version, they made them into these smaller, you know, winged enemies. And the reason they did that, you know, just... While the C64 has done a lot of impressive stuff here, there are some things it just can't do. You can't have loads of very large sprites on the screen. It's just not capable of that. So this was their solution to get around it, and I think it works great. And speaking of things that work great, even though I don't like the parallax effect, you know, even in the arcade version where the background scrolls faster than the foreground, they mimic that here. That's something we don't even get in advanced ports like on the Amiga and PC Engine CD, or PC Engine Hue card. Now one thing that's different gameplay-wise is in the C64 version, you can't go up above and hang out in the top area of the screen and blast these guys as they come down, so you've got to hang back there and do it. So, one minor change in this version. Yeah, overall, despite the change, we've got a great version of the soundtrack. Visually, it's pretty impressive. Gameplay, even though we don't have the big trucks, we have these other things, is kind of spot on. So they did a fantastic job here, and we're coming up to oh, our boss section, even though there's no boss here. All we do is fight a whole bunch of those fast-moving winged things. In the arcade version, we fought a bunch of the big truck things with the sensors on them. Uh, you can only destroy a few of them, because most of them were facing the wrong way. I mean, you can destroy more of them if you put the force on a different place, you know, front or back. But most of the time, you just sit there and just destroy the ones you could and avoid the others. This same basic principle, except instead of lasting for about a minute, it lasts like twice as long. It feels like it goes on for way, way too long in this version. And you really can kind of just park the ship and just sit in one spot, and you'll basically be safe. Uh, I move around a little bit just because I didn't want to just sit still on this version during this gameplay. We're almost there. You'll remember in the PC Engine and PC Engine CD port of the game, after we went through this part, there was a new boss at the end. That's exclusive to those versions. We're not going to see that here. The level just is going to end now. So it's more similar to the arcade one. Right, and here we go into level 7, the game's second to last level. Once again, here on the humble little C64, we get an impressive, you know, sort of faux parallax effect. Most likely done again just with animated tiles. We could see some outlines of black around, you know, various segments of the foreground layer. Because when you're doing these animated tiles, you basically got to make things square. And I wish they hadn't made it, you know, the color that they did. Oh, <laughs> that's a, a big... You know, enemy ship that comes out from behind you in the arcade and PC Engine and Amiga versions and stuff. This one is a lot smaller, but still there. So we still at least have something like the arcade experience there. But yeah, I, I would have went with a darker color, even though we don't have a whole lot of choices on the C64. Might have looked good with the darkest blue that it had, but that might have clashed a little bit with parts of the ship and the bits and the power-ups. So it doesn't look bad, it's just it's a little busy with the high contrast, you know, black with the bright color. Now you can see on that part, there's a lot fewer enemies than in the arcade playthrough that uh, you might have seen me do just you know, a couple of weeks ago. 
And here we are coming up to the boss. This is going to be a little different than the other versions, and it takes a while, so I'll talk a little bit about some other stuff as I fight it. So unlike, say, the arcade and PC Engine and PC ECD versions, you can't really sit and just let the bits destroy the garbage that's coming in from above. You have to go park your ship there so it'll be safe. You destroy a little robot or two that comes out from the ground, and then we destroy this thing with the arm, you know, and the sensor on it. We'll notice there's a little more, you know, flicker and glitching and sprites disappearing on this part. While this game is super impressive, the C64 did still have its physical hardware limits, and we are running straight up against them in this game, especially in this section right here. It's gonna take like four or five times of blasting at this thing before we destroy it. One other thing I will mention, uh, so I was showing this game and, and doing this today as a new series because, partially, I'm still working on the other bigger video that I'm working on. And I don't want to have a, you know, a long gap with no video, so I thought I'd show you this. The other video that I'm working on now is going to also involve the C64. So we'll see a lot more of the C64 in just a week or two here. Is every game going to be as impressive as this one when I show you that next video? Definitely not. <laughs> We're going to be looking at some really old ones, and some that are a little bit newer, some that are well done and some that are, frankly, complete garbage. There's me pausing the game by accident, because I had mapped some different buttons to the controller, and one of them happened to be the pause button, which I think was F7 in this. So sorry about that. And let's talk about the controller mapping right now. So on the C64, of course, we only had one action button, which shoots in this game. If you wanted to launch the uh, force off of you, you had to use the space bar. So modern times here with emulation, we can map the space bar to another key on a gamepad or on the keyboard or whatever. So it makes playing this game a lot more convenient. Not just this game, but a lot of others. A neat little trick, like I talked about in some of my Amiga videos, is for action games that use up to jump, you can map up to a, an extra button so you have a jump button. Anyway, here's our final level on our type As you can see, pretty similar you know, to the arcade version. This was really simple in the arcade. All we had were these little demon baby embryo things, and uh, that's... Pretty similar here, just the angles they come in on are a little bit different. And we don't have the swirly fireball thing that the boss fires out like halfway through the level that circles its way around and we have to avoid. Uh, but much like the arcade version, you can just sort of park the ship here and not even fire if you don't want to. And yeah, this is pretty much all there is to this level, but it's mercifully short, don't worry. We're getting close to the end already. Not the best music in the world, but, you know, that's true of every version of this level for this game. It's just kind of an annoying short little loop. Now, as far as, you know, this specific version, how it sounds, pretty good. Probably better than the arcade and you know, even the PC Engine or PC Engine CD version. So here's our boss, and unfortunately, this is where some of the differences in how the force works really impact the gameplay. You can't just park it in there. You basically just have to shoot while the thing is open. Now in the arcade version and PC Engine, PC CD, Amiga and stuff like that, the swirl behavior is closer to the arcade where it shoots one out, starts circling around, after a while it shoots at another one that has its own movement pattern and so on. And this one just doesn't do that, it just fires it straight at the screen. And you can't park the, the force like I said because the behavior is different, so it's just kind of annoying and in the way here. And since I had the ring laser on this, remember earlier I said when you have the ring laser and you have the bit attached to the front, you don't fire your regular shot, you just fire the ring laser. And the ring laser won't penetrate this thing and hit the boss. So really what you've got to do is either keep the force floating around like this while you shoot regular shots into this thing, or attach the force behind you, which I'm going to do now, and just blast away until this thing is finally dead. Now this fight is way longer on this one. Uh, than the arcade, or pretty much any of the console or Japanese versions. But, on the flip side, it is also way, way easier. We don't have anything to deal with except for the swirl. We don't have the baby things, embryo things, you know, assaulting us. We don't have to deal with those swirly, circular patterns that change as each new one comes out. But, we also can't just launch the bit in there and just chill out until it's destroyed. We've got to actually work for it this time. Not hard, 
just time consuming, which is why I'm babbling like an idiot right now. We're almost done though, don't worry. Just a few more shots and this will be a memory. And there we are. Finally, we are done with C64 R-Type. So yeah, on the whole, I think this game, in a lot of ways, is super impressive. It's not the absolute best version of R-Type. It's not the absolute best fully 8-bit version of R-Type overall. But there are some things it does that are well beyond, you know, the average C64 game, and are more impressive than a lot of the other ports of R-Type. As you can see, the ending here is similar to the arcade version. It did also mention who cracked and trained the game. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like I said, not hiding anything. I didn't actually cheat. I just used save states to make sure that you saw the whole game as quickly as possible without any needless deaths taking up your time. So let's wrap things up, shall we? And there we have C64 R-Type. This game was nothing short of technical witchcraft on the aged C64 at the point that it came out. Sure, there are other impressive shooters or shmups on the system, and there have been even more impressive ones since R-Type in the aftermarket slash homebrew scene. Still, this game was an incredible accomplishment, even though the gameplay was a little rough around the edges in a lot of ways, and said gameplay deviated from the arcade quite a bit too. As I said before, it's not the best or most accurate version of R-Type, but in a lot of ways, it is one of the most impressive versions of R-Type for the hardware that it runs on, retaining a lot of what made the arcade game stand out back in the day, and these are things that were left out of a lot of other versions on more impressive hardware. So I hope you really enjoyed checking this game out. Drop me a comment if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more of this series, or on the positive side of gaming. It's something I can work with on the limited time that I have available to me, since it doesn't take quite as long to make this sort of thing as it does, you know, to make the other videos that I've been doing, and I have a very busy schedule these days. So that'll do it for this video, my retro gaming friends. If you enjoyed it, please like and share it somewhere. If you haven't yet, please subscribe for more retro gaming goodness. If you want to support the channel, you can now do that on Patreon or Ko-fi. With that, I'll say thanks for watching, and see me later.